Welcome to the first podcast for millinery.info. Today we're speaking with Louise McDonald, one of Melbourne's top milliners for over 20 years in her studio in the Nicholas Building on Swanson Street, which looks out over St Paul's Cathedral and Federation Square. Louise currently has two pieces featured in the 200 Years of Australian Fashion Exhibition, which is being hosted at the Ian Potter Centre at NGV Australia in Federation Square. Louise. You currently have two pieces displayed as part of the 200 Years of Fashion exhibition at the Australia NGV. Could you tell us about the first piece, which is called the BB Cap? Uh, yes, so um, the BB Cap and, and the second piece, uh, at Miss Money Penny, they were both made in 2007 um, for my 2007 uh, spring range, spring racing carnival range. And uh, the theme that I had for that range was sort of, you know, the 1960s. Sort of so the BB cap is um, it's, uh, a cap made from a flat pattern, um, a six-segment cap um, that is sort of worn down sort of low on the head. It's got a very sort of small, shallow peak and a sort of a squashy, sort of voluminous um, six-segment crown that sort of, when it's worn, it's supposed to sort of squash down. You know, and flatten down on your head, so to surround your head. And um, I made that BB cap style up in a couple of different materials. One was a grow grain fabric, one was a nice sort of Panama sort of straw cloth, and the BB cap that's in at the um, you know the NGV or the NGV acquired um, is made from a beautiful um, vintage woven straw cloth that I sourced from a supplier in Brisbane, who is uh, still around at the moment, Mimi Millinery, and he um, imported a whole lot of millinery supplies from um, Europe, I think probably in the, he says the 1970s, but I think a lot of them date back to, a lot of the materials date back to earlier than that. Um, And it's um, a beautiful textured sort of straw cloth, and it's got a nice um, body that works very well in that sort of six segment cap style. I think it's a neutral sort of stone light top colours with a little bit of a golden thread I think through the through the um, the crown. Yeah. So is there another one like it out there? There's not one that's exactly the same, but there are ones similar. Um, I have one because <laughs> I was quite fond of that style, and I made one for myself that's got a, a little patent uh, black peak and a cream um, Panama cloth crown. That I remember I wore to the Dubai World Cup in must have been the same year, 2007 or 2000, probably 2008. And there, I've, I've made other ones up in, I made a black grow grain one, and I think I made, um, well, it, I made one for Hugo Boss uh, that would be in a different um, straw fabric, so not one exactly the same. And how did NGV come to acquire the piece? They came to me, it must have been in 2000. And eight, saying that they were, you know, looking to acquire, you know, some millinery pieces for their collection, and um, I was very flattered that they, they came to my studio and we had a look at um, my range, and they, you know, we had a bit of a discussion about what we felt was um, um, a, a good selection that sort of reflected um, my designs, and I guess um, that piece and, and Miss Money Penny were two that I sort of felt very. I related well to, they related well to me, and I thought that they were an indication of my styles at that time. Yeah. And the second piece, Miss Money Penny, what does that one look like? Um, well, that's what is um, less known in the trade <laughs> as a satellite dish, <laughs> Although, um, because it is an upturned um, you know, saucer shape or disc shape that um, you know, sits you know, off to the side of the head, probably forward over the, the right eye. Um, and it's made from natural cinema, and then the edge of the disc is bound in this beautiful, um, wide, patent, vintage, I think it's black, um, straw braid. So the braid is about, mm, it's about sort of, you know, 10 centimetres wide, and then, uh, but around the edge of the brim, it's of about five centimetres um, wide, and then it has a trim that I guess is very sort of, um, you know, part of my signature style, I guess. I like using, you know, the, the straw to create some, you know, movement in the piece. So it's a bit of straw that is sort of tied and, and floating across um, the side of the satellite dish. <laughs> um, 
and yeah. where did these materials come from? Is there a story behind these? Um, well, there is about the behind the definitely the patent straw braid. The cinema um, is you know woven in the Philippines, and you can source it locally. Um, I probably sourced it um, locally, and then the patent straw braid was this beautiful. It's a beautiful patent Swiss braid that I found up at um, Job Warehouse, which is no longer, uh, but it was a, a fabric shop that was up the top of Burke Street in between um, Exhibition and Spring Street. And um, it was a, a funny shop. I remember when I first went, in to the, went into that shop, um, I can't remember how old I was, but it was before I was a milliner, and I went in there and I, it was very intimidating. You know, the shop looked very messy. The windows were just... You wondered whether it was actually a shop or whether it was um, an abandoned um, place, but it just had dusty rolls of fabric and dead flies and musty-looking things <laughs> in the window. It didn't look like a proper shop, and then a few um, old bolts of fabric, you know, um, leaning up out on the against the window on the pavement. And you'd walk in, and you couldn't get as far as. Um, you know, the front counter and there would be three men standing there just sort of glaring, <laughs> glaring at you. And, um, and then I think the first time I went in there, I immediately turned around and walked out again because I felt like I wasn't <laughs> welcome in there. But um, I did learn that in order to, um, you know, fight what you wanted, you needed to walk in and tell them that you were looking for silk or ganza or linen or whatever you were looking for. And then they would um, walk you to the appropriate place in the shop for you to um, browse. But they had, um, I think that the old man who uh, owned the shop, he owned most of the building, that building apparently um, on that block between Exhibition and Spring Street, so I read in the newspaper. And uh, on other occasions he took me sort of upstairs to what seemed like a big warehouse full of you know, rolls of fabric. I remember I got a beautiful quality turquoise linen from there that I had um, a skirt and suit made for me. Um, and then, so that's where I got the, the braid from. And so I remember I got one you know, piece of braid from there, probably about 10 metres in the, in the piece, and I brought it back to my studio and I you know, used it on a couple of hats and I really liked it. So I went back there um, to see if I could find some more and it was a summer day and I had um, you know, a skirt and sandals on and um, I went into the shop and asked you know, the uh, owner whether he had in any more of this braid, because I knew he had it in black, brown, and um, a dark navy. And I was really keen to get my hands on some more. So he said, yes, he did. Follow him. <laughs> he said, follow me. And so he grabbed a torch, and uh, he took me outside the shop, and then we went down to the next little laneway, which I think might be Crossley Street, down the little laneway, and then he came to a door, and he unlocked the door, and then he opened the door. He had his torch, you know, his flashlight on, even though it was, you know, daylight. It was in the morning, and uh, we went in there and stepped into this little foyer, and there were these, uh, it was dark, apart from the, um, the light from the doorway, and all these pigeons fluttering around because they'd been, you know, disturbed by the door opening, and uh, we, we walked inside, pigeons flapping about above our heads, walking along the floorboards, which were sort of spongy because they were sort of rotting from all the pigeon poo that had been there. So we walked into the little foyer, and then I remember we turned left down this hallway, which was completely pitch black except for the torch that he had, and he came to a door, which he unlocked. And then I know it sounds strange, but he might, the door must have opened um, out into the corridor because I remember him kicking away the pigeon poo that was at the bottom of the door because it wouldn't open because of this build-up of pigeon poo at the bottom of the door. So he kicked away the pigeon poo, opened up the door, and there was a small room that would have been about sort of you know five metres by five metres, and it was just full of boxes. It was dark, but he had the torch there, and it was full of boxes, you know, from the the ceiling coming down to the centre of the floor, and you could walk from the doorway into the centre of the room and there was a path, uh, but you were surrounded by these boxes. And he shone the um, torchlight up into the far left corner where, <laughs> um, where these boxes were, you know, positioned everywhere and he said, it's up there. 
And so, and so I had to climb up these boxes, him with the torch behind me, me in my short skirt and my sandals on, <laughs> climbing up these boxes. And I was thinking, oh, it was revolting. And I was worried my foot was going to through the, go through the boxes and there'd be rats around. And anyway, it was yucky. But I was determined to get that straw. So I climbed up to the top and I got hold of as much straw as I could and um, went back down. And I was very happy with my sort of booty. Um, so we walked out of the room, he locked it up, and then on, on the way out of the, um, the building, uh, back in the foyer where the pigeons were, there was this old sort of straw sombrero, dusty sombrero, sitting on the floor, and it had pigeon poo on it and stuff. Anyway, he picked it up, and he took it with him back to the shop, and when we got back into the shop on Burke Street, he said to you know one of the people who worked with him, put this in the window. <laughs> and so um, that made me alerted me to the fact that he did cultivate that very dusty, musty <laughs> looking window. Yeah, so the pigeon, the sombrero with pigeon poo went in the window. But um, it was a great shop and I went back there several times over the years to um, get more stuff. Actually, that would have been probably in the late 1990s that you know, I had that experience. And I remember telling um, people that story um, you know, over the next couple of years. And you know, as some stories go along, you think, oh, no, Oh really? Was it that bad? Oh, may, oh maybe I'm, maybe I'm exaggerating. <laughs> anyway, I knew that they were going to be closing up. They kept sending out notices that they were having a liquidation sale or they were closing down sale. They they did that for years, but when they first started sending them out, I thought, oh, I should get back there and see if I can, you know, get any more fines. So I went up to see them, and he said, yeah, yeah, that's you can go down to the back, you know, the back area again, but uh, you know, come back tomorrow and make sure you bring your fumigation. Gear. And I thought, all oh, right, well, maybe I wasn't imagining it. <laughs> so um, I went back the next day and I went with um, Tina, who um, was working with me at the time. And I also took a camera with me because I thought, mm. <laughs> I want to make sure. opportunity doesn't come yeah. along every day. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So I put on my dust coat <laughs> and I also had a, um, a dust mask. <laughs> and um, he took us around the corner again. And it, it seemed to be a, another room, a different sort of space. And uh, he opened up the door. He didn't want to go in there. It was his son this time. I don't think he was. I think the old guy had um, died, but his, his son um, showed us in. And he gave us a walkie-talkie because he didn't want to go in there, but he wanted us to alert him if anything, you know, went awry. And so Tina and I went in there, and it was just again piled up with. There, I remember we were walking upstairs, but you couldn't really walk up the stairs properly. You were climbing over boxes because there was boxes of buckles and. Um, moth-eaten um, veiling and buttons and zips and hair nets and all sorts of sort of stuff. And that's when I realised that I wasn't imagining my first experience. <laughs> it was, it was it, as um, dirty as uh, I'd Had anticipated. Recalled. Yeah. Anyway, to cut a <laughs> to make a long story long, um, yeah. the braid that I got for Miss Money Penny um, comes from. Um, excursion that, that I described going in there and climbing up all those boxes to get that nice wide beautiful patent Swiss braid yeah so did that make a the braid make a feature in the collection that year or you were oh yes it, it celebrated the, the success so much that it was a feature oh yeah no definitely it was <laughs> lovely stuff to work with and it was not only uh, featured that year but I have featured it um, in other years when when I've um, you know uh, felt it suits the you know suits the task and I think I've even I used it most recently probably maybe about three years ago um, on some smaller little pieces that I made totally out of that that strawberry and I had it in um, yeah French navy so it was when French navy was back in fashion and I had some some brown stuff the black stuff went quite quickly I think yeah so when did you find out these two pieces were to be included in the current collection? Um, I found out earlier on this year when uh, Paula, the curator um, of the exhibition, um, popped into my studio and she told me that the um, exhibition that was going to be on and they were going to, you know, some of my work was going to be featured. I didn't realise, you know, which hat it was going to be. Happily, it was both hats. Um, yeah, so I was, you know, excited about that and then went to have a look at the exhibition when it opened and feel very honoured to be yeah, included in the 200 Years of Australian Fashion Exhibition along with some you know, designers that I have worn and admired you know, since 
I was old enough to for my mum to take me out shopping. <laughs> <laughs> but let's go into yeah. my next question. So within the exhibition, is there a particular piece that maybe outside of the millinery that you're drawn to most? Um, oh, look, I thought that there was, you know, so much to look at and there was lots that I was excited by. I, I really enjoyed the um, that bigger room that had the, the so-called sort of glamour years from the 1920s to the 1960s. I loved some of the... the um, I guess the sort of the patterns or the pattern cutting on some of those beautiful 1950s dresses, and I really loved the. Um, I know that you said not the millinery, but this wasn't <laughs> this wasn't um, uh, credited in the exhibition that I saw. But there were some beautiful paper uh, head pieces on that was you know part of the you know general sort of curatorial sort of display um, that I thought were really really lovely. I'd love to know who did them. And I think they did, did a beautiful job. So um, lovely sort of yeah cut paper um, head pieces on the mannequin heads we were wearing the sort of 1950s-ish um, evening gowns I thought were really beautiful um, and then it was fun to you know work through the exhibition and see some of those uh, designers that you know I, I wore in my sort of 20s you know Christopher Graff and um, I can't remember any other ones. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was really sort of fun to get a little bit more of the insight and history into those designers. Yeah, really enjoyed it. Any other pieces of yours that the NGV have in, as part of their collection? No, they're showing my full collection. <laughs> Whole two pieces. <laughs> so that was very nice, yeah. Well, if you, they were to come into the studio today, what piece or what style of piece would you recommend to them to be including from your current collection? From my current collection? Ooh. Well, um, my current collection, or can I go back a few years? You can go back a few years. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just um, talking early on today. I've got, there's one or two pieces that um, um, I have that I'm quite attached to and, and are my favourites. And in fact, I haven't um, sold them because... I want to keep them as my own. Um, and one of them is a little um, uh, toy boater that I've made from straw braid um, that has two, oh, no, several sort of bright, well, not bright red, but red feather, ostrich feather pom-poms at the back that I think uh, is from a collection about four years ago. Um, and uh, from the year after, I've got another real sort of favourite that um, is... I guess it's sort of like a, a halo headpiece um, that's made from cinema and it has feathers and different bits of sculpting and it's sort of quite haphazard. Um, but I, I really like that and I like the... I have a good photograph of it. My niece is modelling it and uh, the photo was taken by um, Christina Kingston and um, I really like the photo and the piece and I think that would probably be another favourite. Yeah. That I'd recommend. <laughs> Yeah. Is there anything else you wanted to say about the being part of the exhibition? Very pleased to be a part of it, and uh, I, I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, so it was um, really. Don't miss it if you haven't seen it. They've got a good catalogue. Just in case you do miss it, you can always get the catalogue, I guess. But uh, yeah, really great exhibition. And you have um, some photos in the catalogue, and also you appear on a postcard. Oh, do I? Yes. Oh, how about that? <laughs> Very good. I'll have to go and buy one of those. Yes. <laughs> so this podcast, the millinery.info, was brought to you by Louise MacDonald Millinery. 200 years of Australian fashion is running at the Ian Potter Centre at NGV Australia in Federation Square until July 31st, 2016.